in New Gravel Lane, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Williamson, had been murdered. Not only had they been uh, struck about the head, but they had been slashed, their throats had been uh, cut, so much so that the, the, the heads were practically off their bodies. The whole country was in a frenzy. The king himself ordered more guards on duty at the palace. But four days later, with panic at fever pitch, there was an arrest. John Williams, a young sailor, was charged with the murders. There was little evidence, but with emotions in the area running high, police needed to catch someone and catch them fast. Then, in an event never witnessed before or since, the community took justice into its own hands. A man called John Williams was arrested for the murder. He never came to trial because he committed suicide. So a ritual device was enacted whereby this man's body was put on a cart with the murder weapons and paraded through the streets. Williams was brought to this crossroads and, and about where that manhole cover is, they dug a pit, they drove a stake through his heart and they cut off the head. Now by rumor, the skull was kept in a pub called the Crown and Dolphin. The only remaining memory of this horrific episode in London's history is a gravestone that rests at St George's in the East. It belongs to the first victims of the murderer, the Ma family. This gravestone is one of the most significant finds that uh, we've had in recent history, sacred to the memory of Mr. Timothy Ma, aged 24 years, and also his wife, Mrs. Celia Ma, and also their son, Timothy, aged three months. Hawksmoor's church in Bethnal Green, Christchurch, Spitalfields, also has grim connections with death, particularly the plague. Christchurch, Spitalfields would be in an area that was a Roman burial ground and a place of the plague dead. And so in a sense, they, it is on a reservoir of death. When they emptied the crypt of that church was one of the most extraordinary moments in London's history. Bodies were buried six or eight deep. The heaviest coffins were put on the top, so they pressed down like a wine press and just squeezed the bodies until they became a kind of compacted mess. So the church was closed off. It wasn't used for services, but yet forensically, people looking as if they'd come out of the X-Files in masks were laying out the bodies of the dead that went back hundreds of years in the middle of that church. Horror revisited the church in the late 19th century when London's most notorious serial killer struck again and again within the sound of its bells. This building was crucial to the Jack the Ripper murders. All the murders took place in a circle around this building. The final murder of Marie Jeanette Kelly under the car park, just multi-story car park around the corner was the most terrifying of all the murders in which, you know, the whole body was eviscerated, entrails taken out and hung around the room, all kinds of horrors. The 20th century Satanist Alistair Crowley claimed that Christchurch was a magnet for murder. The magician Alistair Crowley wrote an essay in which he suggested that whoever committed these murders arranged the bodies in the five spots around the church to make up a pentacle which would then confer invisibility on the murderer. So if this was the case, then that murderer is forever present and is invisible. The modern era seemed to have laid these horrors to rest, but then in 1974, a murder revived memories of the era of Jack the Ripper. This time it was Hawksmoor's Church, St George's in the East, that was the focus. Ian Sinclair remembers the incident vividly. Cannon Street Road, looking back down towards these dingy shops. That is where this man called Abraham Cohen, when I was working here, had a tiny little kiosk of a shop selling odds and ends. And one day he's found murdered, his body is on the pavement, and there are coins placed exactly at his feet, as they were with one of the Jack the Ripper murders. And the curious thing is that nothing was stolen, but if you went into the shop behind, Inside old cocoa tins was something like 250,000 pounds rolled up in money. How he got that money, why the money was left behind, why the coins were put at his feet, you know, nobody knows. But yet again, the pattern is there, strange rituals, missing heads, curious coins, 
and a possible connection to a Hawksmoor church. It happens time and time and time again. For believers in the Hawksmoor legend, the root of the mystery lies in the architect's conception of his churches. The inspiration in their design is otherworldly, derived from ancient, brutal, pagan civilizations. He was obsessed with the wonders of the ancient world. He was obsessed with the seven wonders of the world. And he drew his inspiration from a whole series of buildings he'd never seen before, that he'd read about, which existed in the Middle East. And he drew his inspiration from these, and he put that inspiration into the churches. If you look at St. George's Bloomsbury, sitting on the top of that is a pyramid. Bizarre, weird thing to, to do. Pyramids feature quite strongly in, in what Hawksmoor's doing. In fact, at St. Anne's, they've, the pyramid, which is originally meant to be at the top of the tower, has been taken down and is now in the graveyard below. Uh, the, the pyramid sort of relates back to ancient Egypt, of course. That is one strand of it. Then another strand, in more contemporary terms, we can see on the American dollar the pyramid with the eye in the pyramid, which is a Masonic symbol. So it relates straight back to, to Freemasonry. Some take this further, believing that a curse has somehow been transported to the present from the distant past. If Hawksmoor designed these buildings by using plates from libraries, that were to do with older buildings, that were to do with rituals that he didn't even understand. Without his knowing, then those rituals are somehow imported into contemporary London. If you copy an Egyptian building in which there was sacrifice, in which people were buried with their grave goods, you somehow duplicate this building and adapt it and put it down in East London you've brought into London something that London can't understand. Well, starting next Friday at 11.35, 24 hours in Soho, a new series following a day in the life of residents and visitors to London's sex capital.